So let's get started reviewing the Equilibrium Kinetic Entropy Dog Review. All right, let's be crazy and start in order. So we're looking at number one here. Which of the following statements describes characteristics of an endothermic reaction? That's key here, party people. All right, endothermic, we should know that we're absorbing energy, taking energy in. Now they're talking in the choices about the sign of delta H. Is it positive? Is it negative? And they're also talking about whether or not the products have more potential energy than the reactants. So as I show you here, I think it's really helpful to draw yourself a potential energy curve. Okay, and I'm drawing an endothermic starting low and going high. The reason I'm doing that because I know that if I'm going to take in energy from my surroundings, that energy goes into the products and we're climbing a hill. I want to go upstairs in my house. It takes energy. So energy is being taken in here. And therefore, from going up, delta H is positive. And in this course, we can look at table I and see that the delta H is negative for exothermic, if you forget. So we know right away part, we know right away that delta H is going to be positive. But the idea that the products have more or less potential energy, go back to the curve. I always tell students in the potential energy curve, if we're going up, it means we're adding energy. And, hey, the products have to have more potential energy than the reactants if energy is going into the system. Kind of like photosynthesis, where we're taking low energy reactants. Water and CO2 are not explosive reactants. Nobody uses them really for energy, but with the energy from the sun, we make sugar. So, so the products have more energy, okay, or they have more potential energy right here, as we said here than the reactants okay so that's why number one is a the sign is positive you should know that and the products have more potential if you don't see it draw yourself a curve okay uh number two uh i said the answer was a even though i did not cross that there a student dissolved the salt in water know the temperature of the water decreased stop if the temperature is going down if it's getting colder, we should all know it's endothermic at this point. Why is it getting colder? Because endothermic reactions absorb heat from the environment. They take in heat. So the environment temperature gets cold. Understand the temperature that we always take is the surroundings. We can't take a temperature from the chemicals that are involved. They're using the energy to do something. So if something is endothermic, whether it's physical or chemical, they're taking energy from the surroundings. They're absorbing it and doing something with it so the surroundings get colder, so it dissolves endothermically. We've talked about this before. Coal packs, okay, or just salts that do what? Dissolve and are endothermic when they dissolve. So we, that's something that's, that's old. Number three, the temperature rises above zero. Which phase change occurs? Hey, it's melting. Okay, they have water here. We should know that the melting point of water is approximately zero degrees Celsius. So when we're above that, we start to melt. Okay, so party people. And remember our phase diagram here? Remember this? Remember, that was a little bit of review here. We have the solid phase and we have the liquid phase. And then we have this phase change, which, by the way, is at equilibrium. Two phases are, are here. But in order to climb the ladder, oh, my gosh, to go up, we need energy. That's why this is endothermic. Okay. So, any case, look at my choices. Water, solid, going to liquid. Liquid has more energy. We're going to a state of higher energy. This should be a lot like what I just talked about. I'm going to a state of higher energy. How do you get to higher energy? you need to absorb energy. So ice requires some heat on the reactant side to become water. So this is an endothermic process because, hey, in order to go from a low energy solid to a liquid, it's endothermic. Now, how do I know it's spontaneous? Well, spontaneous means that we have a process that's following the idea that the entropy is increasing. And entropy is a measure of how well things spread out. In nature, things spread out. They don't become um, collected to nice piles. In the fall time, leaves fall everywhere. We try to rake them up in nice organized piles and put them away, but things in nature spread out. All right, so how do I know this is spreading out? Well, I know that a solid, okay, has a regular three-dimensional, what, arrangement. And then liquids, okay, 
don't have that same arrangement. They can, you know, they're not they're they're not in a crystal form. So we would say that liquids are a little more spread out. Most liquids, okay, a little, are definitely less dense. Water is not one of those examples, but the liquid has more motion. The water molecules have more motion because they're not stuck in a crystal. So we would say that liquid is more spread out than a solid. And if you think about an ice, okay, on a table, let's change the color because I can. When it melts, what happens? Think with me now. Of course, I have the ice cube is green. It's a gross ice cube. But when it melts, doesn't it get smaller? And doesn't the water start spreading all over the counter? It's spreading out, my friends. So entropy is increasing. When, thing, when entropy increases, we call that spontaneous process. That's how the universe works. We call spontaneity, okay, when it follows the idea that things in nature spread outward. Okay, molecules spreading out, entropy increases at equals spontaneity. So spontaneity is, is basically saying entropy or this idea of things spreading out or energy spreading out or becoming more random, entropy is increasing. It's a measure of that randomness that's spreading out. Okay, that's what spontaneous means. So that's why a C is the answer there. Okay, number four, we have a little chart. And basically, we're talking about the rates of reaction. And basically, we're saying which trial, which trial would produce the fastest reaction. And I look at my uh, data here. I know that smaller particles will react faster because they have a higher surface area, right? They have more exposed molecules or atoms or ions that can hit other things. It's about collisions. If I have a greater molarity, a greater concentration, there's more of them. I always say greater number of dancers the greater chance of collisions. And temperature is proportionate to the kinetic energy. So if temperature is higher, molecules, or in these case, ions are moving faster, they're going to collide more often. So these three factors are better than lower temperature, than lower concentration, and larger sizes. These common, This combination of these three factors would give you the fastest reaction rate, kind of like the lab that we did. Okay, the fastest reaction rate should have been, okay, the higher surface area dust, higher concentration of HCl, and the higher temperature. I think we had two out of three work in our flavor. Okay, so in any case, uh, we would say that D is the answer there. All right, so given the reaction in equilibrium, that's important. Notice the double arrow. Do you notice the double arrow? Okay, so the rate of the forward equals the rate of reverse. And because of that, these things are staying constant. But they're saying, wait a minute. I've got uh, this at equilibrium. If I increase the concentration, okay, what's going to happen to the forward reaction rate? Well, we know if we increase N2, if we make more N2, the reaction is going to shift to lower N2, right? So if you have too much N2, mm -hmm. it's going to shift to lower N2 and make more products. And when we say it shifts, what we're saying is, hey, the forward reaction rate is now faster. And why is it now faster? Well, if you have more N2, they can collide with more H2s, more dancers mm -hmm. on the dance floor. We just talked about higher the concentration, higher the reaction mm -hmm. rate. So if we add a stress of too much N, N is going to actually react with H2 more often, faster in the forward, and that's your shift. And notice the word effective collisions, right? That's going to be more collisions with a great enough energy to lead to more products. Okay. So in any case, moving on to number six, an increase the surface area of the reactants in a heterogeneous reaction. Heterogeneous just means you have solids and possibly liquids or gas. You have different phases. Remember the sawdust demo? You notice I burned some sawdust in a pile. It went pretty slow, but then I blew it over a flame, and you saw the rate of reaction increase greatly. Hey, it's a surface area demo. Increase the surface area. You're exposing more atoms to the collisions with oxygen. It's combustion. And therefore, D is the answer. That should be an easy one from last week or the previous test. Seven, given this reaction, okay, reaction occurs more slowly when a single piece of zinc is used than the same mass of powder. This is kind of like our lab. The lab didn't work out as well as I'd like to, but we should know that a powdered zinc has greater surface area, more exposure. We've kind of worked on this. Uh, it's an, that should be an easy one for you tomorrow. Eight, which of the following will occur if a catalyst is added? Well, we remember a catalyst, and we have a nice little picture down here, changes the pathway, and it lowers the activation energy. Like right here, 
This is the activation energy of the forward uncatalyzed. If I add a catalyst and I change the pathway, the energy at the top of the hill got smaller. Now the energy right here to get to the top of the hill, the catalyzed forward is now lower. Okay, so that's basically we should know that a catalyst increases the rate of reaction because it decreases the activation energy. Without this catalyst here changing or making a new what? pathway we would be stuck trying to climb to the top of this slide all the way to the top and that's a lot more energy that we need to add to start this and if you always think about the idea that if i want to ride a slide and who doesn't ride a slide like ride slides taller slides are what take a longer time to climb before you ride them if i have 10 minutes to get as many rides in a slide as possible hey if the slide is shorter it would, I can get more rides in for the same time. It's kind of a good analogy there. Catalysts, okay, lower the energy needed to start the reaction, get to the top, okay? All right, and that's important that you know that. They lower the activation energy. All right, so let me just erase this. So I'll probably need this somewhere else. So it lowers the activation energy, my friends, in chemistry. Or my enemies, if you hate this. So that's why B is 9. Number 10. Here's a potential energy diagram, kind of the same thing. Which reaction would have the lowest activation energy? Now, it gets confusing, but notice what I'm doing. Okay, notice what I'm doing here. I'm starting, let's get a different color here. Uh, I'm starting at this starting point, and I'm going to the top of the hill. That's the activation energy of the uncatalyzed reaction. And that's the forward. Okay. And... The reverse, if I start here and get to the top of the hill, would be way over here, okay? Now, the catalyst changes the pathway, so the forward catalyzed re reaction, now the catalyst makes a new hill that's lower. That little hump is now medicated, like to say. Without medicated or unmedicated, it's uncatalyzed higher. But with a catalyst, this pathway is lower, so my friends, this activation energy here of the catalyzed fold reaction is smaller than the catalyzed reverse. And that's why A is the answer. Okay, I know I drew over those, but you can see that I drew the catalyzed and uncatalyzed, okay, forward and reverse. Remember, forward is always moving from left to right. And I always say it's where you start to the top of the slide. And if we're starting lower, we're gonna go higher here. So important that you know the difference. So the forward, lowered, catalyzed is the shortest activation energy here. If you just look at the lines. Okay, so 10 is A. Uh, I like when 10 is C, but hey, you can go there on a vacation. Number 11, given the reaction, when the reaction reaches a state of equilibrium. Whoa! Okay, that means the rate of the forward equals the rate of the reverse. And if that's true, the amount of these reactants and products stay constant. The greatest example of that, I have 11 people on this line. I got two people on this line. If I, if I say one person changes from each line every minute, meaning one goes here and one goes here every minute, the people are changing on a line. It's called dynamic equilibrium, but the actual number stays constant. So we say that at an equilibrium, the uh, concentrations of the reactants, they say reactants here, but it would be also products, okay, stay constant. And that's because the rate of the forward equals the rate of the reverse. Classic understanding of what equilibrium means. Okay, number 12. A sample of water is sealed in a flask, and it's in equilibrium with its vapor. And I kind of drew that down here, okay? This is an example of what type of equilibrium. Well, if I've got H2O liquid becoming H2O gas, my friends, those are phase changes. So therefore, it's phase equilibrium. Okay. Chemical equilibrium is when we have things that are chemically changing, not phase. Phase changes are physical. So this is chemical equilibrium. We're changing the chemical formulas, right? Okay. And then solution equilibrium is when we have something dissolving and becoming a precipitate. All right. All right, so 13, a flask is partially filled with water and stoppered after a period of time. The water level remains constant. Which relationship best explains this observation? Well, if this line, if I have an eyeball here and I'm looking, this line doesn't change if I have a stopper on here. Why? Because the rate of the what? 
evaporation equals the rate of the condensation. And that's another example of equilibrium. Things stay constant. So that's why we have A. 14, not feeling the green. Okay, let's go back. 14. What change takes place when a catalyst is added? We've just been over this a million times. We lower the what? The pathway. The, the, the top of the hill is now smaller. Now, what gets people with this question is that the rates of the forward reactions, they increase unequally. Okay, we know that the reaction rates increase with a catalyst, but what happens? Well, what you need to know is when you add a catalyst, you don't change the energy where you start and where you finish. So therefore, the difference in where you start and finish, you should also know that's delta H. That doesn't change. But, okay, we're going to speed up the forward because we're lowering the activation energy. We're also going to speed up the reverse as much because we're lowering its activation energy. So all that a catalyst does with equilibrium is it makes you get to equilibrium faster. So the rates of the forward and the rates of re, uh, reverse increase equally. So we're not going to get out of equilibrium. We're just going to get there faster with a catalyst. So 14 is C. 15. All right, now we've got Le Chatelier's problems. This is a pretty complex um, concept, but we've got it. But we can do this. Given the reaction at equilibrium, what addition? Uh, the addition of what I will cause a decrease in the concentration. So they're saying, what stress? So they're saying, what stress here will cause us to shift in a way to decrease the concentration? If I'm going to decrease the concentration of this chemical. And there it is, and the, there it is. It must mean that I'm shifting away from it, right? It's going to use it up. Think of the tank demonstration. The water on this side is going to be poured onto this side. Therefore, these guys go down, and these guys go up. So they're saying, which of the choices would be the stress that causes me to shift to the left to cause this to go down? You have to understand, they were asking about the stress. If I'm decreasing, the reaction is going to decrease. That's the response. So knowing the response has to decrease this, it must mean that we're shifting away from it to use it up to make more of the products. So what stress will make me shift to the left? Well, the answer is increasing H3O, H3O plus. If you look at three, it says the addition of what ion? That means what can you increase? If I increase H3O+, plus, the reaction is going to look to decrease H3O+. Plus, and that is what the shift does. That's what the reaction does. So it decreases H3O+, plus in response to you increasing. Humans do the stress. They're saying, why is, what can we do to make the reaction decrease this? We can add a stress that increases H3O+. Plus. All the other choices will make it shift the other way. All right. So increasing H3O plus, the reaction is going to shift to do what? To lower. Look at this. By increasing this, it's going to shift to the left and it's going to lower this, which is going to cause the other product, or in this case now the reactant going in the other direction, to decrease. Okay? So that lowering of H3O plus will cause a shift to the left, which will result in the other chemical on the same side to decrease. I know there's a lot there. Okay? 16. Given the reaction at equilibrium, an increase in the concentration of O2 will do what? Well, if we increase O2, the reaction is going to do the opposite to regain its balance. Things in nature want to work toward equilibrium. Equilibrium is spread out. Entropy increases. So if we add too much O2, it's going to lower the O2 to regain its balance and get to equilibrium. So the response of the reaction is to lower O2. In the process, how does it lower O2? It lowers O2 by shifting to the right, okay? And it winds up increasing CO2. Look at this. If you increase O2, the reaction is going to shift to the right because it wants to lower O2, right? So in the process, I'm not sure what's happening here. In the process... Okay, hold on to your ponies there for a second. In the process, that goes down as it shifts to the right. So what's what's so as I shift to the right, this goes down, but you notice that we're going to make more CO2. Okay, and we're going to make more water. 
and we're going to lose more methane, CH4, but which choice is right? So if you look at the question, an increase in the CO concentration of O2 will shift to the right, and it will result in an increase in what? Well, it won't increase, it won't, there won't be a decrease in water. If we're shifting to the right, there'll be an increase of water because you're pouring more water to that side, if you want to think about it that way, or you're just making more of the products. C makes no sense because we won't decrease O2. Okay? So um, it's going to increase the concentration. So if we increase the concentration of O2, it's going to, um, well, you know what? It's going to increase the concentration of O2. And you know what? I could also accept C, okay, that it will decrease the concentration of O2 as well. So in my opinion, there's two choices. Now, what the regions is after is after what the products are. The regions would like the CO2. All right, so I, I, I can see that this question kind of has two answers. The best answer is B. Um, so an increase in O2, they're not going to say it leads to a decrease in O2, but we know that that's what's happening as I teach it. They're saying, hey, I um, increase O2. What do I do to the other thing? So they don't normally answer questions about themselves. So I can see why you would circle C. They want to see what increasing O2 does to other things. That's why B is the best answer there. Okay. All right. 17. Given the reaction equilibrium, which stress on the system will increase the concentration of AB? Right away, if you want to increase AB, we better be shifting toward it. We must... Pointing toward it means that we're going faster in the forward and we're building up AB, we're building up heat, and we're using up these guys. Okay, so which stress will do that? Decreasing the concentration of A2? Well, if I decrease A2, this thing will shift to make more of it. So that wouldn't be it. Okay, so how about pressure? Anytime you deal with pressure, you count moles of gas. Well, if we count the moles of gas we can see that there's two moles of gas on both sides. So when the mass, if there is no gas in the entire reaction, or the number of moles of gas are the same, there's no way to uh, change or shift due to pressure. So there's no effect here, okay? And you say, well, how do I get two moles? Look at the coefficients. There's one gas, here's the other. So the entire reactants have two. The products only have one chemical, but there's a two, So and they're what? both gases. So that's important. You understand that. All right. So gases are not a factor here. If you look at C, increasing the temperature. Okay. That depends where the heat is. We see the heat is on the product side. So if I increase this heat, this reaction is going to look to what? Lower the heat and use it up. And that would shift in the other direction. Okay. But we want to increase the concentration of AB. So we know we're shifting to the right. All right. And look at D increasing the concentration of B. What does that do? It wants to lower B2. How does it lower B2? It lowers B2 by shifting to the right. So they add B2, the reaction changes by trying to lower it, okay, by shifting to the right, which leads to more AB, all right? So D is, I'm sorry, 17 is D. On to 18. Given this reaction in equilibrium, okay, which change would shift the equilibrium to the right? Well, let's go right to pressure. Because uh, in this case, if you notice carefully, we have how many moles of gas on one side? Well, we have four. Three. Nothing in, nothing in front applies one. And then we've got two. And so we have four gas molecules over here and two. If you increase the, pr uh, in, if you increase the pressure, the reaction wants to shift to lower the pressure. Okay? And how does it do that? Well, it's going to shift in a way to lower the moles of gas. What creates pressure is collisions of gas molecules. So if you increase the pressure, the reaction is going to shift to lower the pressure to create less moles of gas, four to two. We're going to point where there's less moles of gas. So, that, so what's going to cause the shift to the right in this case is an increase in pressure, not an increase in temperature because temperature is on the product side. So if you increase the temperature, it's going to shift opposite to lower. Okay, you want to use up the heat if we're increasing that, so that can't be. Decrease N2. If you take N2 away, it's going to shift to make more. It's going to shift opposite. 
Decrease H2, same thing because they're both reactants. You decrease the reactants, the reaction is going to want to shift to make more of them. Okay, always do the opposite. So the only thing that makes any sense here, all right, is the pressure. And anytime you have a pressure stress, count the moles of gas. Now, they said a decrease in pressure. We would shift to the side that has more moles of gas, and that would be a left, okay? But that was increase. All right, so 17, my friends. I'm sorry, 19. Given another reaction to equilibrium, as the pressure is increasing, we're going to shift to the side with less moles of gas. So the number of moles of SO3, which is what? Which is a product, will increase. Because, again, it's pressure, so I count the moles of gas. 2 plus 1 is 3. This side has a 2 in front, and that's it. And they're both gases, so 3 goes to 2. And so we want to lower the pressure. That's the response, because we added too much pressure. So it's going to shift to the side that has less gas to create less pressure. So that's why the pressure, the number of moles of SO3 will increase, because we're going to shift to the right. Use up the reactants to make more products. Number 20. Given the system, which change will not shift the point of equilibrium? Well, we count very carefully. There's one mole of gas, one mole of gas, two moles of gas. So changing the pressure will not have an effect. Kind of been down that road already. Changing the temperature definitely will. That will shift it this way. C, changing the concentration of HF. Well, increasing it would make it go to the left. Decreasing it, make it would make it go to the right to make more of it. And then changing H2. Same idea. So the one that has no effect is the gas. Yes, I'm still in school. Okay, 21. Given the equilibrium system, which conditions will yield the most product? Kind of a weird question, but yield just makes makes the most product. I want to make the most product, therefore I want to what? I want to shift this reaction to the right. Okay, my friends. How can I do that? Well, since the energy is on the reactant side, notice it's in front of the arrows. I know it's endothermic. Most importantly, if I increase the temperature, okay, it's going to shift to lower the temperature and shift away from the heat. And that, therefore, I know I'm going to shift to the right there. So, hey, higher the temperature, I'm going to lower the temperature. I sit, I'm going to shift to the right because the energy is on the right. It's in the what? Before the arrows. So if I have too much heat, it's going to shift to lower the heat, use it up. So that would create more products. What about pressure? Count the moles of gas. We've got three moles of gas, and we've got one. If you increase the pressure, it's going to shift to lower moles of gas. So both of those stress stressors are going to make you shift to the product side, shift to the right, and make what? Big black arrow right there. Make more of the products. Okay? So that's why... 21 is D. 22, given the reaction equilibrium, okay, equilibrium will shift, shift to the right if the temperature increases. And why? Look where the temperature is. It's in front of the arrows. Party people. If it's in front of the arrows and we have too much of it, we want to what? We want to lower it. We added too much heat. So the reaction is going to undo that stress, that's what Le Chatelier's principle is, it's going to undo that stress to try to regain its balance and get back to equilibrium. So too much heat, this is going to shift in the forward. All right? So, and therefore, uh, that would be it. Now, if, it was on, if the heat was on the product side, which it's not, increasing the heat would go the opposite way. So make sure that you understand that where the heat in the reaction is determines the shift based upon the, the stress, all right? So if I was to decrease the temperature, this reaction would shift to the left to make more heat and it'd favor the exothermic way. But just treat the heat, the energy, whether they put the word energy or heat, it doesn't matter. Treat the energy like another reactant. This is a reactant on this reactant side. And if the heat was over here, treat it like another product. And that's a nice way to remember that. I got too much heat. Is the same thing as having too much O2, which means we have to lower it. It means it's going to shift to the left. Okay, so that's the one way to think about that. So the temperature increases will make it shift to the right. Notice the pressure has no effect because the moles of the gas. What's a half plus a half? Remember, these are gases. A half plus a half is one. Okay, 
So just to clean this up, so we've got one mole of gas on one side. How many moles of gas in the other? If you don't see it, open your eyes. There's one right there. So one equals one. So there would be no effect by pressure increase or decrease. Temperature is the winner. We just talked about that, and temperature decreases would not work. It'd have to be an increase of temperature so that the reaction shifts to use up the heat. Okay, 23. Another reaction in equilibrium. Okay. Now, I have this reaction in equilibrium. Notice the double arrows. And they're saying we're going to add potassium sulfate. Well, potassium sulfate is a salt that in, in water is going to dissociate into two K pluses in sulfate. We should know this right now. Sulfate is in table E. All right. And these are the two ions that we are going to have when they dissolve. And we know that group one ions dissolve, so you can use table F to know that. But essentially, you're going to be adding potassium ions. And if you look back at the reaction, there is no potassium ions. So that, that would be a spectator. But look at the arrow. We're actually going to be adding a common ion, a sulfate ion, which is in this product. So by adding this to the reaction vessel or the beaker that has this reaction going, we're really increasing this guy. Too much sulfate means that we're going to, what, shift to the forward to lower it. If you need to see that, by adding potassium sulfate, we're really increasing it. So what's it going to do? Lower it. How does it lower it? The response is going to shift to the left. Why? Because it's a what? It's a product. It wants to lower it to get back toward equilibrium. So the temperature, so the calcium plus two is a product. If we're going to shift to the left because we're adding too much of the other product and it wants to regain its balance, the two products in this case are going to decrease. And, and therefore the calcium sulfate, the guy on this side is going to increase. 23 is C. They should start seeming very, the same kind of questions. Okay. Now we're going to talk about our entropy questions. We did these in class, but I'll go over them again. Which series of physical changes represents an entropy increase? Think of entropy as spreading out. Think of randomness. Think of a big rock eventually becoming smaller pieces. That's how energy spreads out. That's how the universe works. Our universe is actually expanding, right? Um, so that's also true. Things in nature spread out. The energies and the stars spread out until the stars run out of energy. Any case, if you look at our choice of number 24, which series of physical changes is spreading out? Solid, okay, has a regular repeating geometric pattern. Liquids are more looser and gases fly around the room hundreds of miles an hour. So the entropy is increasing here, okay, because we're going up in the freedom of movement. Molecules can move more freely more degrees of freedom, they're spreading out more. Entropy is increasing. Entropy is a measure of that spreading out. That is part of one of the ways the universe works. Number 25, as we talked about today, we have pure argon, all right, and we have pure neon. And then we open up the valve, and these gases are going to what? Spread out into each other's container. The argon that was here is going to spread out as well. So if they're spreading out, we would say that the entropy is increasing. And that's as simple as that. 25 is A. 26, you have phase changes. Where is there an increase in entropy? Where are we going from a solid to a liquid to a gas? Well, choice C. Liquids, although they're not as, um, um, they, they have more degrees of movement of a solid, but gases have more degrees of movement than a liquid. So the so liquid to a gas is spreading out more. If you notice, your other choices are going the other way. A gas going to what? A liquid means that you're, you're not spreading out. You're kind of compacting. You're putting molecules together. That's going against entropy. Look at this. A ga gas going to a solid. That's going against entropy. We're not spreading out. We're putting things in ordered structures. We want to break things out. Think of trees. Uh, leaves on a tree, when they fall, they go everywhere. They don't go in neat piles. What we're trying to do here is put something in very neat ordered structures. That goes against the idea of entropy. So that entropy is decreasing there. And then here I have a gas going to a liquid for the same understanding. So the only one that's spreading out, okay, is C, 27. Which reaction has an increase in entropy? So we've dealt with phases. We've dealt with gases opening in a flask. But now we're going to deal with not phases. We're going to look at 
how many particles are changing. If you think with me in A, we have two what? Okay, we have two water molecules becoming two H2 molecules and one O2. So two particles are becoming three. And you would say we're spreading out. If two particles become three, three particles have more degrees of mo movement than two. Remember, think of entropy as a big rock becoming into small rocks. So if you're going to break apart into more particles, that's going to follow entropy. Look at your choices. Number B, you have what? Three particles becoming two. That's putting stuff together. That goes against entropy. Here we've got three things becoming two. I'm just counting how many of these particles. We're putting stuff together. Here we've got one plus three, four things becoming two. So all the other choices except for A are going the other way. They're taking more particles and putting it into a smaller number. We're building something. That's not what entropy does. Entropy spreads down, breaks down. So the only one that's spreading out based upon number of particles from left to right is A. C's back on the phases. You go from a gas to a solid. Gases have a lot of freedom. Solids wiggle in their fixed position. We're not spreading out. We're putting back together as a gas becomes a solid. So the entropy is decreasing for C here. And then 29, as products are formed in the reaction, okay, entropy is doing what? Well, there's two parts. They have the entropy and the heat's doing what? Let's do it with the heat first. If I see the heat on the reactant side in front of the arrow, that means it's going into the reaction. The reactants need it. They're absorbing it. It's endothermic, and that's why I have absorbed here. But look carefully about entropy. I've got one formula here breaking apart into two pieces. And if one thing decomposes into more pieces, we're spreading out. Entropy is increasing. That's why 29 is D. And then 30. System is said to be in a state of dynamic. Dynamic means motion. Okay, things are moving. And it says equilibrium. We know two things about equilibrium. The rate of the forward equals the rate of the reverse. And because the amount of water I'm pouring from one tank to the other is the same. They stay constant. So D is the only one talking about the rate of the forward is equal to the rate of the reverse. Why do they mention dynamic? Because I don't want you to look at something in equilibrium. It looks like nothing is going on. I want you to know that there's things going on. We may not be able to see uh, equilibrium as the products become the reactants as fast as the reactants become products, but it's happening. So dynamic is just reminding you that there, that those things are happening. Okay. I hope that helped. Good luck tomorrow.